Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ARC's weekly fireside chat. Today we'll be in our second part of our series on healing, forgiveness, and restorative justice. Powerful, powerful, powerful combination of both need and, and something that, that we should all want in our system today. I have to give a, a couple of warnings. This is some serious, deep content. So be aware that this difficult subject matter that we will be covering today with some very powerful people. Uh, I'd also like to share a couple of things with our audience as I do every week. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll find a ribbon and the ribbon has different icons, including chat and Q and A. If you'd like to ask questions or communicate directly with us, please put your questions or your chat into the box and we will answer them as time permits. Thank you everyone again for joining. And I'd like to get us started by introducing some incredible human beings that have definitely made uh, my life better. I'd like to introduce Jacob Rivard, Eugene Ballas, and Cheryl Ward-Kaiser. Uh, Jacob, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Rivard, and I'm the Associate Director of Inside Programs here at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, also known as ARC. I am a former lifer. I spent 25 years in the California Department of Corrections for a gang-related murder. Thank you, Jacob. Eugene, could you introduce yourself, please? Good morning, everyone. My name is Eugene Balance. I served, I'm also a former lifer. I served 26 years, eight months, and I'm part of the Hope and Redemption team. I go back into the institutions and I share my story and hope to impact people's lives the way Cheryl has impacted mine. Thank you, Eugene. And Cheryl, could you introduce yourself and your story, for your incredible story, to our audience? Hi, my name is Cheryl Ward Kaiser. Um, of course, my life didn't start, but I guess this part of my life started on June 14th, 1991. Uh, my family was a home sleep in bed. My daughter was 17 years old. My husband and I uh, were both in bed and all of a sudden I heard a noise and I thought my daughter had gotten up and gotten sick. Next thing I knew, I yelled her name and when I did, two very large men entered my room with handguns and shotguns. They racked the shotgun so I'd know the shotgun was loaded. We never got out of bed. The guy with the handgun came around my husband's side. The guy with the shotgun came around mine. They pulled us out of bed, put the handgun in my husband's mouth, pulled me out of bed and put me face down and I had the shotgun to the back of my head. Now we have four guys in the house, two stay with us, two get my 17 year old daughter. They eventually brought her in the room kicked her, picked me up, hit me with the shotgun. These guys have been told that I have a safe. So I have four guys in the house, they've been told we have a safe and that we have money in a safe. I don't have it. But they believe it with everything they have. They make my daughter stand on the bed. They make her strip her clothes off. They put the shotgun in her mouth. They tell me they're gonna blow her effing head off. I, I knew what that would look like but not enough. He eventually raped her with the barrel of that shotgun. Still not enough. My husband had never been allowed to stand up in the entire time they'd been in the room. He was on his knees going back and forth just between these two closets in our bedroom, looking for the safe. The last line said was, we're gonna rape your wife and your daughter and we're gonna make you watch. Is there anything worse, guys? then you're a father and you're watching them do what to ever to your daughter and now they're going to rape your wife and your daughter and, you're, and you've already watched her rape with a shotgun anyway he stood up for the first time in 48 minutes as he stood the guy that was getting ready to rape her came up behind him and hit him in the back of the head with the shotgun shotgun goes off in the bathroom floor struggle goes into my closet uh, heard a muffled shot, heard a thud hit the floor. You know how you know what you know? Anyway, they came out of the closet, no big deal, didn't bother them. Uh, get a hold of me, still bent on raping Roxy, and let's find that safe. 48 minutes, we're still, we're still looking for a safe that doesn't exist. Um, with that, a car came on the road. The guy that had his foot on my back and the gun to my head, keeping me in check on the floor, was the last one to leave, told me not to move for 15 minutes. The moment he hit that hallway, I'm up. And I turn around and there's my daughter on the bed, 
totally nude, wrapped up in a ball. They tell me that's what people go back to after they've been raped, but, but I can't mess with her. I gotta go in that closet and I gotta find out if my husband's alive or dead. And of course, how are you supposed to feel for a heartbeat? I screamed at Roxy, I said, get in here, get dressed, do CPR, because guess who doesn't know CPR? They did uh, CPR and uh, she tried to save her father and he breathed three breaths and he died in Roxy's arms. Total most appropriate place for the man to die, he died trying to save his daughter. Eight minutes later, the sheriff's office was there. The sheriffs on my case stayed up 27 hours and all five of them were in jail. The hard part for me in my life is I had worked with youth my entire life. And these guys were 18, 19, and 20 years old. The girl, the one that, the lookout, she was 16 year old girl that drove their getaway car. Got an education of a lifetime putting them away in court for 22 months, fighting the system. F didn't understand why I was in the hallway for 22 months other than to testify. I wasn't even allowed in the courtroom because I was too strong a victim. I was gonna change the course of what happened in that courtroom. So I fought for some kind of, they take power away from you. You lose control. You have no power in that room. And what you fight to get back is power. I fought for my power. And in doing that, I learned about restorative justice. I learned a word that I didn't understand, but I knew what it meant without having a word. I needed, I needed to talk to him. I wanted to know what in the crap had gone on in your life in that short amount of time to have you want to come into a bedroom of a family and brutalize them torture a family. Why? Why did they do it? I, I worked with kids my whole life. Why? And that led me to restorative justice. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, there's so much more we want to cover, but I, I'd like to ask you, can you talk about forgiveness and, and who is forgiveness for? Well, a lot of people have a hard time with restorative justice because they think you have to forgive. I, I think restorative justice leads you to forgive, but you don't have to forgive to be a part of restorative justice. You can need to know answers. You can need to know questions. You can need to go face to face with somebody. You can believe like I do, that they don't owe the system. They owe me. They owe me, my family. And I wanna be in charge of that, not the state of California. I wanted to have conversations with them. And I did that with the girl. I was the first one to do it in Hawaii's history. Sat down with that young lady while she was in the California Youth Authority. And I sat and had a con to tell her two things. I don't hate you and I forgive you because I don't care whether they, for they accepted my forgiveness. They, it, they needed to hear me tell them that I don't hate them. That was so powerful for me to do that. And would you believe in that three and a half hours with that young lady? She did never, she never did say she was sorry. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. I eventually did it with the guy that was his, with my foot up, he had his foot on my back. I went and saw him for two hours and uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't do a restorative justice victim offender mediation. I couldn't get the system moving fast enough. I finally got it moving, but it's still, oh. Anyway, I'm still fighting the system. But I did go behind glass and I did get to talk to him. And, uh, and then I've, I've got, uh, I, I've written all the people in my crime. Um, I still write all the guys in my crime, um, not the girl, but I still write all the guys in my crime. And, uh, and they're my guys, understand this? That's what I call them, they're my guys. And they will be my guys to the day I die. And um, I feel that way about them. I, you know, it's funny when, when you don't hate, how different it all is. How different it is when you don't hate, how this changes, my whole life is different. I don't. I don't have one thing about my life that's the same as it was before, other than I still live in the same house and I still sleep in the same bedroom. That I do. I was never going to run from this. I we turned around as I say to people and I embraced this crime and I embraced it with the only thing I know, which is my Christianity. I mean, that's how I forgive. It's that simple. <laughs> would, you, would you say that that's giving you 
because earlier you, you talked about the, the court and, and the process taking your power away. Would you say that, that the steps that you've taken have given you been able to take that power back and that is with you now? Beyond an imagination. Um, I went and talked to the guy that raped my daughter. And boy, everybody, nobody would go with me. Nobody wanted any part of me going to that, to do that. Not, not nobody. And uh, I had to drive five and a half hours to get there and I'm glad I did. Uh, now, and I kept telling myself I had to do something. And what I had to do, because you can see I'm tough. I can, there's a tough cookie sitting here. But when I walked into that prison, I had to keep telling myself, shields down, shields down, shields down. Because see, who had to walk into that prison was Roxy's mom, my daughter's mom, who that young man had to see sitting across from him was not this tough cookie. I had to let go of that and I had to allow my vulnerability, all of that to show, to sit down with him. And I sat with him for six and a half hours. And he gave me the apology of a lifetime. He took total responsibility for the murder, even though he never pulled the trigger. He said, it's my fault your husband's dead. What I did caused that murder to happen. Never did I expect to hear that out of him. It took him two and a half hours to even look at me, but I hugged him when I left. And I can't even begin to tell you. I knew I was gonna help him, but I had no idea what that was going to do for me. No idea whatsoever of how that was all going to set me free. Because see, us victims, we're not free. You all may be in prison, so are we. And we have to find ways to earn and work our way out. We do. Wow. We do. So, so Jacob and I met you many years ago. Yeah. Uh, but, but wanted to ask you, how did, how did you end up going into prisons? And we'll share how Jacob and I met. But how did you end up going into prisons? Well, once I started learning about restorative justice, it was from a lot of people in Fresno. And Fresno really is, was the hub of restorative justice. That's where you got all kinds of conferences and all kinds of things. And I met a guy named Jerry Hill, and he was a volunteer for a prison fellowship. And he volunteered in Vacaville Prison. And he called me one day and he said, you know, Cheryl, I got this class in Vacaville. What was one of your guys' names? So I told him all the list of the guys' names. And he goes, oh my God, he's in my class. I said, are you freaking kidding me? He goes, yeah. He goes, you know, we're doing a symposium. Why don't you come? So I went to the symposium and I probably got up and talked for five minutes at that. I mean, I didn't do a big talk. I just did a, but they didn't allow him to be in the class. Needless to say, they pulled him from the class. But I got to, and I saw the power of what I could do that day with those prisoners. And then I just started getting asked to go into, finally got into to Selena, to, to CTF. It took me 19 years to get into Salinas Valley, which I felt I should be in a level four prison. I mean, it was murder, it was rape, it was all those things. So let's talk to them. The, everybody said, why? They're not gonna get out. I said, bull crap, maybe they can get out. Maybe we can do things to cause this all to be different than what it is. Maybe I can make a difference. Why not try? Why not try, right? Absolutely. So, so I'll say this first. Uh, I told you this many years ago. I don't know if you remember it, but I told you at the end of, uh, or the last time that I saw you, that I, I consider you both a hero, a, a hero, a hero in my personal, like, hero. Like, you're tough. But <laughs> in a compassionate way that, that I didn't understand so deeply back then. But before I go further into that, I'd like to ask Jacob, how did you meet Cheryl and, and what impact has she had on your life? Well, I met Cheryl somewhere around 2006, 2007 at uh, CTF Central Solidat. I was serving my life sentence at the time and uh, she came in to do a restorative justice class that I took part in. And at the time I was, uh, I was struggling with, uh, uh, with rehabilitating myself uh, of, and becoming a new person. Um, and what Cheryl did for me inside that classroom by sharing her experiences was she showed me a different side of, of, of forgiveness. You know, all my life, people was always 
vengeful. It was always get back. It was always, you did this to me. I need to get you back. And Cheryl was the, her story and her presence was the first time that I had ever seen anyone actually pr really forgive someone. And um, it just changed my perspective in life. It changed the way that I viewed my future. And it allowed me to start forgiving some of the people that caused trauma in my past, which took away a lot of my anger and helped me grow and, and mature into the person I am today. Thank you, Jacob. And Jacob and I uh, attended the same class at the same time in CTF. And I'll never forget every night going back from those classes, just the amount of, of, of thought of how, how can someone has gone through so much have such a big heart and be willing to forgive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in my mind, I'm like, I need to learn how to do that. Uh, and I need to be able to be vulnerable enough to, to admit all of my wrongs. And that put me on a path to, to accept all of the things that, that I had done wrong. Still thinking that I might never get out of prison, <laughs> uh, but, but willing to say, I'm willing to be held accountable for what I've done. And I learned that I'm not going to ask for forgiveness, but I am going to apologize because forgiveness is a gift to be given. Uh, it's not something that, that, that I had a right to ask for after the damage that I had done. And so that put me on a path that, that literally changed my life. And being home now almost nine years, uh, we reached out to Cheryl, wanted Cheryl to know, like, you impacted us in such a manner. Back then, on a prison yard where we thought we would never be getting out of prison, in, in, in a way that, that uh, no one else could. And, and it led us to a path that, that we're on today. Uh, one, wanting to lift the voices of survivors, of people who've lost loved ones to violent crime, and, and, and figure out how to create more restorative justice, not just in our prison system, but just in our communities across the country. We need it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an absolute uh, necessity. And I want to thank you again. I thanked you all those years ago. I want to thank you again, Cheryl, for, for the gift that you gave me that continues to live on and the work that, that I do with, with our organization, whatever, everyone else, every day. Eugene, yeah. Sam, I wanna ask, uh, can I thank Cheryl too for, for, for putting my life on track? You really had a major impact on me. And I don't think that I've ever really properly thanked you. I know I thanked you after the group, but I, I wanna thank you in public. I think that you deserve all the accolades that you get. And I, I thank you just for, for the amazing person you are in, in creating change within the system that we know is draconic and don't work. Yeah, we're gonna change it. And Absolutely. all of us are gonna change it. Can I introduce Eugene? Absolutely, please. <laughs> you know, I can't even begin to tell you because this is a first for, for him and I and for us. But Eugene, that I'm gonna be introduced, uh, was Eugene Balance was the lookout in my crime. And I, I've been writing Eugene since I think, uh, 2000 or I don't know something in there good 20 years I've been writing Eugene uh, in prison and uh, how many years has it been Eugene that you've been out two out two years two and a half two and a half years I think he's been out uh, I think he got out on February the 7th and uh, he's having trouble anyway Eugene um, is out of prison and just this week he got off of parole. So he's not only out of prison, he's off parole. So he's now a 100% free man. And he called me that day, which exactly what we should be able to do with each other. So as I would like to, I would introduce you to Eugene and uh, let Eugene ask, how, how does it feel to be a free man, Eugene? <laughs> Honestly, it, it uh. It's like a it's like a new birth. It's like because growing up and all the things that I experienced as a, as a child and as a youth, it, it tainted my vision of the way the world should be. And so a lot of the things that I did, even committing the crime, and and it, it boggles me why we had to go through such pain and terror and inflicting that pain and terror just on people in general. And you and, and James and, and your daughter, it's like, for me, it, I still wonder, like, why, why did a life have to be taken? Why did lives have to be destroyed to save so many lives? And I'm so grateful to you and to your family because my life is saved. And I continue to every day save lives. And, and that's what I'm into. I'm trying to show people how to change their perception. Like, 
no matter how you were brought up, all those pre-recorded things that we told ourselves that that mindset, you know, where we have to be this way and we can't be that way. Those are all the positions that I operate from, which led me down that path. And today, because of you coming into my life and, and having faith in me and telling me, I remember you telling me, I remember, I remember you told me, you owe me, you're going to do good, you're going to do better. And I'm going to help you get there. <laughs> Eugene seems to have, have frozen. He froze in time. <laughs> he froze in time. Uh, so, so as soon as the young priest will come back to Eugene, uh, but Jacob, I want to ask you, uh, what role has forgiveness played in your life? Oh, for, for, forgiveness has played a tremendous role in my life. Uh, like I said, uh, in the past, I was a guy that held on to things. I wasn't a very forgiving person. Um, and so that led me down a path of violence and in, uh, in where I ended up in prison during the life term. Uh, and then I met Cheryl and I started seeing the power of forgiveness. And so uh, I started to forgive all the people that had caused harm and trauma in my life, which uh, surprisingly took away my anger and made me, well, it didn't make me, it, it gave me an opportunity to choose to show up as a different person. Uh, and so then I, I decided that, you know what, I'm not a violent person. I'm, I'm, I'm kind, I'm gentle. I'm, I'm all the things that I was when I was, when I was a kid. And, um, but in order for me to be that way, I have to constantly forgive people because forgiveness is for me. It's not, it's not for anyone else. It allows me to move forward and it allows me to mature and become the best person that I could possibly be without holding on to, to things that I uh, have decided that I didn't like or that I had a, a negative impact on me is the best way to put it. Uh, so uh, forgiveness played a major role in my life and uh, without forgiveness, I wouldn't be the person I am today. I probably would still be sitting in prison in someone's shoe program or something. And so, uh, like I said, I'm very thankful to, to be forgiven and to forgive other people. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, to, our, to our audience that's listening and watching, again, if you want to ask questions, uh, type your questions in either the Q&A box or in the chat box. Uh, remember, go to the bottom of your screen. You'll find a ribbon, and the ribbon will say uh, Q&A or chat. Uh, we're live, so we will see those. And uh, as time permits, we will answer any questions that you, you uh, have. Uh, for me, the forgiveness that I, that, that I learned from you, Cheryl, led me to forgive my dad. Here's the key. That, that was, and I, that's where most of my issues began as a, as a kid. And I like just to be transparent, I hated my father at one point in my life. I mean, like really, really hated. And that translated to hating pretty much any authority figure and anything that had to do with rules or authority. Yep. And and to see you to be to see you being able to forgive, I asked myself, who am I not to forgive my father? Uh, and so again, I want to thank you. Eugene is back. Eugene, wanna ask you, what role has forgiveness played in your life? I'm sorry, it's breaking up a little bit. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. And so I believe the question was what forgiveness means to me. Yes. You're breaking up now, Eugene. You, you need to go to one spot and not move. Hey, hey Sam, uh, can I take this opportunity to also highlight some of the other people that came in with Sure World Kaiser? I think Absolutely. It, was, it was a, a team, it was a there was three other uh, ladies that came in and shared their stories. Uh, one in particular uh, was a lady who had uh, who was sexually assaulted. Uh, I remember a story pretty pretty well, pretty vividly. And um, I think the totality of all the, the stories and uh, just having firsthand knowledge of the experiences and of the traumas and the things that they went through because of uh, what was done to them. You know, I think I think that that was very very powerful. So I I also wanted to highlight these these other women for for allowing themselves to be vulnerable and 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 investing in us to be in better people. Thank you, Jacob. Eugene, uh, in our chat box, people want to hear what you have to say. So we need you to get somewhere where there's Wi-Fi. If you have to get in your car and go to a Starbucks and do that. <laughs> go to know, Starbucks. So so Eugene is literally at, a, at one of our work sites where the Wi-Fi is down and he's trying to find a signal. Uh, sure, there's a, a person in our chat box says, I work inside CDCR institutions. How can I facilitate restorative justice activities at my workplace? They actually have, uh, there is a 
there is a curriculum for restorative justice. There is a victim impact classes um, that can be done. Um, you know, they put that word on there, uh, the, the correctional system that they believe in restorative justice. So it's pretty hard for them to refuse not to do this, but there is there, they can do classes and there can be classes in, in and, and, but you know, I go and talk and I go and talk in an AA class, I go talk in an NA class. I mean, they bring me in for anything. And because my story, which is way longer than I'm doing today, but because it kind of touches all realms of all of that, um, you know, you can bring in speakers and put them in anywhere you want to sit them. And if somebody, you know, has a life changing thing that happens, yay team, uh, you know, it, it can be done. Um, you just have to go to your, the, the person that does your programs at your prisons and get them going. They, they've, I've, I've been going for years doing this. So I know they, they have them in the prisons. I know Vacaville had them. I know C, uh, Il Soledad prisons, CTF, uh, Salinas Valley. I mean, they, they have programs. It's there, you can do it. Thank you. Uh, Eugene, if you can hear us, take your video off and just go audio, and at least we'll be able to hear you. If you just go just audio. Is that good? You can hear me? Yeah, you can hear me now, Eugene. So could you tell us what role does forgiveness play in your life? Man, for, forgiveness gave me a life. Because before forgiveness, my life was just in shambles. I was a, a hurt person. I was a ball of pain hurting people, not even taking into account the type of pain that I was inflicting upon people personally or the type of pain that I was allowing people around me to inflict on others when I know that I had the power to say something or to help prevent it. Forgiveness, it, man, it, it made me who I am today. And Cheryl, you guys say Cheryl is this nice human being and this, Cheryl is, she is literally my angel. And, and, and you know, I've, I'm able to touch so many people, not only with my story, but with my heart. Because of Cheryl, I have all that love and that compassion and that understanding in my heart. And she knows I love her so much. And man, I'm glad it's not longer than what it is because I'd end up crying and then we'd have to start a whole new series. It's just, that's just how I am, you know, because it's, it's from my heart and I mean it. Yeah, I, I'm just, you know, it's just growing up the way that I grew up and, and not having people in my life to really care you know like it's one thing for someone outside of your house to say they care about you but then after when three o'clock comes basically when school is over it's like I'm right back to everything that I'm thinking the world is supposed to be and for me it's different because Cheryl told me it wasn't a, it wasn't a question it wasn't a it wasn't even a statement it was a demand you owe me you're going to live right. You're going to do better. You're going to save lives and you're going to get out of here and you're going to start doing what you need to do. And I was like, yes, ma'am. Cheryl is not only my angel, she's like my mom too. So, you know, if any of you really know Cheryl, then you understand exactly where I'm coming from. And that's why I live and I walk the way that I walk today, changing lives. And I'm also grateful for, for Jacob and you, Sam, because you guys gave me the opportunity to go back into the prisons and to help these guys see that what we think life is and what we think it isn't what it is if we're coming from a position of pain and, and confusion. And, and, you know, when our, when our vision is distorted, like how can we see what we're doing when, when we're so distorted and, and, and clogged in our brain? I, I, I feel like I'm rambling, but I hope I'm making sense. I didn't write anything down. All this is from my heart. So I, I hope I'm making plenty of sense to someone. I just need one to understand and change. You're, you're not around, you're making plenty of sense. Uh, trust me, what you're saying is, is very impactful. I, I'd like to, to ask everyone, what does it mean for people to be able to have the opportunity to move on with their lives, either after surviving a, 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 a harm or a crime or after being incarcerated? Uh, for you, Cheryl, what does that mean? You, when you have something really bad happen to you, like we did, you have to do something with it. Um, I have a lot of friends, well, all my friends, I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any normal friends, whatever that means. Um, I, all my friends now have, most of them have lost their children. Um, have, their kids have been murdered. Um, and it, you've got to do something with this. You, you can't just I, I love people, move on, put it behind you. All these stupid terms that people have that have no idea what they're talking about. You can't. So you got to figure out something to do with this. And that's the only way you move forward. Otherwise, it becomes a cancer 
that eat you alive. And I've got friends that have had five heart attacks, have pacemakers, and all of it's because they can't, they can't move, they can't function, they can't, all there are is full of hate and, and all it does is eat you alive. And I watch it and I try to tell them, I can't tell them. You know, you can't tell, you have to show people. It's what I tell people, you're telling me that you're changed in prison, then you tell me your numbers. I wanna know what your number is. I wanna know how you're living your life because the only way you make this right is by how you live your life. You can't bring a life back. You can't, you can tell people you're sorry till you turn purple. Show me you're sorry. Show me that you're gonna live your life like you guys are living your lives, making a difference. That shows me that you're sorry. Um, you have to really live it. You have to walk this. If you don't walk this, it, and if you're gonna walk that other path, really, honest to God, it eats you, it eats you alive. Because it doesn't go away. I'm, I'm 29 years. I, I, I'm going on 30 years of this crime, and it doesn't go away. When I describe that crime, I'm in that room. I've got that gun to my head. I'm there. And people tell me, why do you relive that? Why do you redo that? It's there anyway. Hey, stupid, are you kidding me? You know, maybe I can make a difference with it by reliving it. By making someone get what I've gone through, maybe they won't ever have to walk through what I do. And I hope, you know, for me, my work that I do in prison is probably the most healing thing I've ever done. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Jacob, for you, what does, does it mean to, to be able to move, move on uh, with your lives after, after like, as, as a former, as a gang member, like, both of us lived that, that life, like, there's a bunch of anger and hate in, in, in that box right there that, that, okay. that you have to move away from. So what does it mean in the dual purpose of being able uh, to survive, su survive harm and incarceration and, and, and move forward with your life? What does that mean to you? Well, uh, let, me, let, let me start by saying that all my issues, like you were saying about your father, all my issues started inside the home. And gang banging, drug use, and all that stuff was symptoms of a problem of, of, of trauma that was undealt with. Uh, and the process that Cheryl was talking about when she says that it becomes a cancer and eats you alive, uh, that was my experience as a young man. Uh, I experienced a lot of traumas that I didn't, I didn't have the, the tools to process at that time, and I didn't have the uh, communication skills to verbalize it, so it started showing up in my behavior. And uh, I was never able to process it. I was never able to move, move, move along because I, I wasn't forgiving anybody. I was waiting for an opportunity to get back, uh, to, to get some revenge. And so by the time I was 18, 19, 20 years old, I was extremely angry at the world, and uh, I didn't really understand why. Uh, so for me, this, you know, move, being able to move past the trauma was, it was life changing. Uh, it changed me into a whole different person. And when people see me today, uh, uh, they, they, they can't even imagine the person that I was. They said, man, I can't imagine you like that because the anger is gone. Uh, all the pain and the trauma is gone. I was able to move past it, but it took me to start forgiving the the people. I had to forgive my parents because they did the best that they could. I had to forgive uh, my siblings and I had to forgive the people in my environment that, that, that caused trauma in my life. Or, uh, it, you know, that, it, that enabled me to become the person I am today where I can enjoy life. And, and part of my enjoyment in life is helping other people. Uh, that's what's fulfilling to me. That's how I, that's what motivates me every morning to get up out the bed. And, uh, and it also, uh, shows that uh, it shows me that uh, because I, I'll put it like this and I'll be quiet, Sam. Uh, I was able to accomplish a lot of stuff while I was in prison and since I've been home from prison, but I realized that all my accomplishments has come at, at the cost of Mr. Randolph's life. Uh, without him losing his life, I wouldn't be the person I am today. And I, I always keep that in mind in everything that I do. And so everything that I do, is like a, is a homage to him. And I still speak to him every night. I speak to him and say, hey, man, you know, this is what's going on. And I know it sounds crazy, but that's my connection, and that's what keeps me moving forward. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, and, and for me, same, same thing. Like, I've been shot, stabbed, and, and 
once I understood what it meant to be able to forgive, the best way I, I could describe it is like the anger and hate that I had in my heart was like almost walking up a hill with a big old bag of rocks. It's, it's impossible to get to the top of the hill because that, that bag of rocks, that hatred like in, in my heart, I, it was too heavy right? and, 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 and it manifested itself in a lot of different ways by it, it especially hurting other people. Uh, and even today, when, when I feel slighted, it lasts maybe 30 seconds. Uh, and, and, and I'm able to move forward because I'm like, if you hold on to that, that's just wasted energy. So for me, these are lessons that I learned in, in a place where hope didn't exist when we were there uh, in, in, inside our prison system. And these lessons, when people say there's nothing you can take, take home from prison that's good, this was something that was good that, that I've internalized and, and, and I walk with it every day. Uh, one of, one of our, our viewers is asking, uh, he said that his journey with self-forgiveness was a long and difficult one. How important do you view this in terms of healing, Cheryl? It's the beginning. You, can, you know, the, that's the hardest part as far as I'm concerned is, uh, is to forgive yourself for something. Um, when I do my whole long talk, I talk about the fact that I got pregnant and I placed a son for adoption and I spent 20 years, and I still do, I sp I've spent my whole life fighting the feeling of hating myself for getting pregnant and, and affecting somebody else's life. I didn't have the right to affect somebody else's life. That's why I tell the whole story that um, I did something. I, I did something my, to my own son. And, uh, and, and I have him. Mean, I got to go meet him. I met him when he was 26 years old, and he's in my life. But it's not perfect. I can't, I can't undo that all. The hard part for me, though, is that forgiveness of myself. And I see that. So, I mean, I talk it. That's, we have to forgive ourselves and then we have to go back and find that thing. Not the thing that got you to prison because that's not the thing. It's the thing that all the anger, as you guys all talk about, the father stuff, the home stuff. There's what we have to go back and forgive. There's the stuff we have to work on. Ourselves, forgiving ourselves, and then being able to look at somebody and say, you know, I don't, I don't have a clue, dad, what you were going through in your life, but you know what? I forgive you anyway. You know, you did the best whatever you could do for whatever you had going on. And, and you know, love is, love beats it all. So, you know, it, it's just something you got to do. And, and it, uh, but it's a battle. It can be a battle every day. It's got to, it's something you have to keep battling all your life is to constantly know that we have to keep forgiving ourselves and, and seeing as, as he said, you, what's got you where you are and who you are and what you are. And it's just today. You worry about what today is and working with people around you and doing what you can do. And then God takes care of tomorrow. So we don't need to worry about what happens tomorrow as much as we do what happens today and what we do and who we are and how we live our lives today, who we are to people around us. So, so, so that question was uh, from Artie Gaza and I wanted to share, I, I had this. So, so first and foremost, thank you for that, Cheryl. Uh, mm -hmm. But I had the same struggle with, with forgiving myself too. Uh, and, and I prayed about it and, and uh, like I believe my personal belief is you find that forgiveness in yourself once you truly know within your heart that, that uh, this is not who I am and it's not something that I'm ever gonna do again. And I wanna be able to give back and change the world in a way that uh, is meaningful. And, and help others that are like me or that are young that may make those mistakes, never make those mistakes. Uh, Deborah Neal wants to know, Cheryl, do you have a website or email address? Are you in Northern or Southern California? We'd love to hear you speak. Uh, I suffer with anger issues. Yeah, don't we all? Get on the highway and find out that everybody's suffering from anger issues right now. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't have a, I don't have a website that has, but you know, you can type in my name and obviously everybody can find me. These guys, I have no trouble about people giving out my phone numbers or addresses or whatever. So maybe they give it to you. I am in, I'm in Salinas, California. Uh, I'm where all the fires are happening right now. Um, so I live in Salinas. I travel it, you know, I, I don't expect to get paid to do what I do. That's not what I do it for. I never have. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I have tight my, I was a caregiver to my mother for 10 years and my mother died this year in the middle of this pandemic. So, uh, I now have time to go do more talks. So I'm more than willing to go talk wherever anybody, you know, whatever. And I, 
I don't know, God's given me a gift. I makes me laugh, I guess, that I got a D in speech in high school, and here I am talking to people. It does make you laugh how God can use the strangest stuff in the whole world and, is, and a twit to get up and talk and, and know I can affect people. I don't know. I, it's a gift been given to me. I, I really, truly believe that. I have a gift, and God's given it to me. And you know, part of what I have to say about forgiveness is once I understood that God had forgiven me, then I could forgive. Who am I to say I can't forgive if, if God can forgive me? So, you know, that's, that's kind of, that kind of is the big thing for me. He can climb on that cross. He did all that. I think I can just pretty well shut up and keep moving. So, so that's a question to, to everybody. But first, like you literally, this was from an audience, but I, had, I just wanted to see, I see some of these questions coming up. I wanted to share them. You literally just answer one. Do you believe you need uh, to have a strong faith base to be able to forgive? Uh, so Cheryl, then Jacob, and then Eugene? You know, I, you know, I can't imagine my life and not being Christian. So I, 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 guess, I guess you can. I don't know. I, I, I only can speak as a Christian. I, I know that that's what people ask me. How long did it take you to forgive? Uh, I had my, the priest that did my husband's funeral talk on forgiveness. I knew I was going to have to forgive. I just didn't know how it was going to take place. And the greatest gift I had is the first time I saw them sitting in the courtroom and I looked at them, I knew that I didn't hate them. And that was the greatest moment. It was like monumental for me to know right there and then that God had granted me the gift of not hating them and, uh, and that I could forgive them. And that as a Christian, I, I, that's the only way I know how to do that. I mean, it's by the grace of God that I'm doing whatever I'm doing. So everything for me has to do with God. So it's all has to do with, it all has to do with him, everything. That's my whole life is, is wrapped around whatever God wants me to do, I'm doing. Amen. I, I just say yes, that's the, just say yes. <laughs> Eugene, uh, same question to you. Do you think uh, to be able to forgive at, this, at that level, do you need a strong faith base to be able to forgive? Um, I think that at some point, um, getting in touch with oneself, with your heart and knowing what I wanted for once I was able to change, uh, let me just go back a little bit. Cause I, I, I wanted to say this, but I didn't get the opportunity to, to say this, like from, from my early years, all the way to being in prison until Cheryl came into my life, I learned to blame people and to make excuses as to why I did things because of the way other people made me feel. And before Cheryl forgave me, she told me, she demanded what she wanted me to do. So I want people to know like, if someone wronged you, you don't have to forgive them to tell them what you expect of them now. Like, I mean, I mean, she has every, I cannot replace or redo or fix what has happened, what I am responsible for. So. I am literally at her mercy for whatever it is that she needs. Like, that's just the way that I live my life. And she knows this. I've told her this. And so to, to, to forgive, is, it's like, man, it, it's powerful because I don't think that had it not been for sure that my life would have gotten on course as soon as it has or even if it would have it at all. And that's just being honest. Like, she saved my life. She saved my life. So forgiveness for me, it, it, it's, it's life changing, it, it's life altering, it's, it's a blessing. I, I mean, I'm out here living a miracle every day. I have a son that's about to be two years old. Like I didn't see this 20 something years ago. I didn't see myself 20 something years ago. I see the world for what it is. My lenses are no longer clouded. I mean, I see and I understand and therefore I do what is expected of me as a human being and as a man. So forgiveness is absolutely important. Jacob, do you think it, it requires a strong faith base to be able, or belief to be able to forgive? I mean, I, I forgive from a strong faith base, but I don't think that it's necessary, necessarily necessary uh, to have a strong faith base to forgive. I think forgiveness is something that you do for yourself. Uh, Sam, Sam has, has introduced me to a concept called uh, extreme accountability. And that helped me out tremendously uh, with, with seeing some of the things in my past and realizing that I had a role, uh, that I played a role in a lot of the traumas that, that happened to me. 
and I'm not saying that uh that I went out there and asked for anything bad to happen to me, but I realized that a lot of the issues that I have with my father was based on the expectations that I put on him. He showed me time after time after time that he wasn't there for me, that he couldn't be there for him. That's who he was. But I kept saying, oh, he's going to show up. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And I created trauma. And so uh, when I look back and I took that extreme uh, accountability, I was, you know, I'm, 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 I'm able to, to kind of like see that, you know, he, this was not directed as at me per se. This was directed as uh, at the at the the image of me, but not of me as a person. And that I personalized it and I ran with it, and then I let that I used that as justification to harm other people. Uh, but that process of forgiveness, uh, it does not have to be face based. But I, for me, it is. I, I'll echo that in my answer. For me, my mine is. Definitely, like, to survive, come home, and have the attitude, uh, uh, as Scott always says, the attitude of gratitude uh, and, a, and an open and willing heart. Every morning, I thank God. Every night, I thank God. Uh, and, and when he decides, like, it's time for you to come home and your work is done, then I'll stop doing what, what we've been doing. One last question. So uh, while we're we getting more people uh, uh, asking questions, but... Uh, so, so we there, there's some invites which we'll pass on to you, show for you to come speak. Thank you. I see that. Okay, and and the other thing, and so so what we would like to do too, just just so the audience knows, we would really like to team up with you uh, as an organization to support uh, restorative justice and, and 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 to to like double down our efforts. We we do quite a bit of restorative uh, or, or rehabilitative work with a component of risk restorative justice but we want to double down and really expand on, in, in that area, especially in places like we were talking about a little while ago, maximum security prisons. There you go. The, the places where, where we believe that this message needs to be heard first. So as people come down from those maximum security prisons, their, their thought process is already one that, that is seeking to change and, and, and make uh, uh, the system better and, and themselves better. Uh, last question. I like to ask everyone, and, and I kind of spoke to that, but as more people are coming home right now, what does it mean to prioritize healing and fairness and granting people their freedom? Yeah, you know, uh, boy, a lot of people just getting let out. I'm not sure how many victims are being notified that they're getting out, because I see that, I saw that in my own cases that uh, the paperwork didn't follow the, the guys moving from prison to prison. So a lot of victims, may not know that their persons are out of prison. I mean, uh, if you can imagine walking in a store and all of a sudden I would walk into an Eugene not knowing it, how that can affect somebody. Yeah, this can be really interesting what's happening, especially as many prisoners as they have let out. Um, I, I just wish there was better things going on to get people ready to get out, to get, and, and of course no jobs and nobody's working and all that, uh, I don't know. I, I wish they, I, you know, I just wish they let you guys vote in prison and I would get to be governor of the state of California and then we could change a lot of things. That's <laughs> you know, I've said it because I know I could win. Um, <laughs> my vote. <laughs> it's just, you know, there's so many things we could do in that prison and we could make it different and get guys ready to get out and do whatever here. Like, my goodness, this, you know, and just to release them, it's like, <gasps> You know, my first thought is, okay, all these victims and all these people have no idea all these people have been released. And then, I mean, this is how victims become offenders, people. And, you know, because they're not ready for this on either side. So we have to, you know, there's a lot that needed to be done, not just let them out the door. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a open the prison up and let everybody go with kind of person. You got to get there. You got to show me you can get, look at them. These guys are showing you that they can, you can, we can get here, but by God in heaven, don't just open the door and let a hundred, what did he, 118? I don't even want to talk about how many people just got out. It's, it's frightening to me because boy, did they really honest to God know all those men were ready to go? Really? Anyway, that's just me. Uh, Eugene, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Eugene, you want to answer that? As, as more people come home right now, what does it mean to prioritize healing and fairness and granting people freedom? Well, you know, um, like I know, like, you know, some people are ready in this real state and some people aren't. It's just 
It's just hoping that, you know, having the, I guess I would say like, sometimes it's good not to be so quick to judge someone for what they've done, but try to see what it is that they're doing today. Because then that would help someone, you know, that is in a place to where they might be struggling to continue to do the right thing, even in difficult times. So for me, I would say that's, that's why it's, it's very important. And Jacob? Uh, well, you know, uh, you know, my belief is always in uh, the reinvestment in, 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 in the people that's are, that are incarcerated. So uh, in order for the system to, uh, to release people in a responsible manner, I think they have to create opportunities for them to improve themselves while they're in prison and also take away a lot of the barriers that uh, preclude them from reentering society once they get out of prison. Uh, they're not being able to find a job and uh, not be able to find housing because, because you're a felon. If, if, if we're gonna forgive people for uh, crimes after they serve their time, we need to forgive them and welcome them back in the community and allow them to show us that they're ready to be productive. But on the front end of that, we, 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 the prison system has to be more focused on uh, rehabilitation and providing opportunities for people to educate themselves and put themselves in a position to, uh, to deal with a lot of the trauma that they also went through, or uh, whether it was in prison on the street, and allow them to, to take hold of their family and be productive out here in society. I, I'm going to put a, a pin in, in exactly what you just said and what Cheryl said. And so, in, in my opinion, uh, when considering the number of people that, that are released, I think the answer is, 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 is simple. Look in the files. If you see a person, and, and regardless of what the commitment offense is, right. this person has been disciplinary free for 20 years, 15 years, uh, has been in college programs, anger management, restorative justice, taking every program, boom, this person Ooh. should be considered. And, and like literally, ask the, 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 the officers that, that are in the building, that see you seven days a week, that know when you're having a bad day, how you deal with it. And, and I, say, I say it from the point of, in many instances, the, the, the number of people are released, people that committed violent crimes aren't, aren't, aren't included in that group. And they're not included because of the commitment offense, but what if you looked in the file and said, this is the perfect person, this is a Jacob, a Eugene, or a Sam that, that has done the work and literally is just taking up space now and, and, and we can move this person out and they will be an asset to, to the community. So, so I, I think uh, the, the solution is, is there, it just, it, it needs to be meaningful. Uh, uh, I'm going to go, go uh, take us to a close. Now, first and foremost, I just want to thank you again, Sheryl. You, you remain uh, a superwoman to me, uh, always. And uh, any last thoughts for uh, our audience that's listening? You know, I guess my last thoughts would be doing this makes me know that I keep going. Um, I, I thank you guys for what you have to say. I mean, what you had to say to me today, I, I don't know who got more out of this, me or any of your audience, uh, I probably did. Um, you help in my healing, guys. You're helping me heal. That's what restorative justice is. And that's what this is all about. We restore each other. Thank that's you, Cheryl. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, last thoughts for, for, for our listeners. First, I would like to start off by uh, thanking Cheryl for once again uh, being impactful in my life. Uh, it just, it's, it's, it's a reoccurring event, you know. Uh, it happened in 2007. Here it is in 2020, and, and here it is. She's impacting my life in a positive way again, so I appreciate that, and I appreciate her. But I, I, I just want people to know that people to, 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 to realize that forgiveness is the key to everything. Uh, if we can't forgive, we're not going to be able to grow without maturation, without being able to mature into, uh, into like full blown productive human beings. We're always going to keep running into that cycle of destruction and self sabotage. And so I think it's great that we have uh, people like Cheryl who comes, who comes along and, and, and shows us that example of forgiveness and allows us to follow that path. So thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh Eugene, last thoughts for, for, for the people that are listening, for our audience. Um, my last thoughts would be to, if you can, be like, you know, see somebody in a different light if they're trying to change. And, and But for me, again, I have to say, like, I, I wanted to change, but I didn't know how. 
and it took someone to come into my life. It took Cheryl to come into my life and to show me, like, this is what you need to do. This is how you change. Some people really want to change, and, and they're, they're lost. They don't know how. And I, I know that sounds so immature and so simple, but it's the honest truth. And I'm telling you this because I, I was one of those people. So to, to have forgiveness or to tell someone what you expect of them because they wronged you and you know that, that in their heart they really want to do better and they, and they are truly remorseful for what they did, tell them. So they know that you're, you're invest, you've already invested in them. They need to know. They need to know. I'm going to leave it with that. And thank you so much, bro. You already know. Uh, my, my last thoughts for I've seen quite a, a few times in our chat box where people are asking how they can help. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, we do rehabilitative work inside the institutions. We do a lot of reentry work. Look at our website. We will definitely be teaming up with Cheryl, one of the most powerful voices that, that I know of, uh, to work to be able to do more restorative justice in our institutions and see what we can create in our communities. You have that commitment from me as the executive director of ARC, and I'm certain our team uh, want to do this. And my last thoughts uh, for people listening is, is, is really simple. Once I learned what restorative justice meant, and, and, and I read more about it, I read about the model that they used in South Africa. I read about the model that they used in Rwanda after a genocide. Yep. And I said, we're, we're, we're eons behind these countries. We need to practice this in our country, uh, not just in prisons, but in our communities. And I would hope that people would take time to uh, look into it to understand what restorative justice is and what it means, it, what it means to our communities and to our families and to our country as a whole. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, we so appreciate you. We definitely will probably call you back as people will, will be demanding to hear from you. And for the audience who sent out a message to Cheryl, we'll make sure that she we'll gets get them. Thank you. And thank you, Jacob. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Everyone take care. Be safe.